The years between World War I and II were comparatively few. A score, less than a generation. But aviation, in all its adolescence, had charged the imagination of the world. And in America, perhaps more than anywhere, there were barnstormers and air racers. Daredevils. And true visionaries. Billy Mitchell proved the battleship vulnerable to air attack. In 1927, a tactical demonstration of aerial refueling was accomplished by Captain Ira Aker and Major Tui Spots. The Luftwaffe was never licked in World War I. The people just let them down. They had a basic plan at that time to take Europe on again. Then they were going to take us on. That was all they thought. General Benjamin Folloy, Air Corps pioneer and early proponent of the B-17. That was when we started the long-range bomber over here. We decided then that we weren't going to wait for them to come over here. If we got into trouble with them again, we were going over there. World War II strategic bombing genius Curtis LeMay started out in fighters, however. It dawned on me that uh, the big punch in uh, military aviation was in bombers and not fighters, and I'd better know something about bombers. So I requested an assignment to a bomb unit and it was granted. That started me off in the bombardment business. The Strategic Air Command was born of the need to build a protective shield around our right to be a free people, our right to exist. Blue sky for the Air Force. An arm and armor, symbol of strength and loyalty. An olive branch for peace lightning flashes for speed and power. All qualities underlying the mission of the Strategic Air Command. When American forces were catapulted into World War II, they were not prepared. The Army Air Corps was undermanned and saddled with largely obsolete equipment. But its leaders were fully convinced that strategic bombers, penetrating to the heart of Germany in unescorted daylight raids, would bring industry and transportation to a halt, destroy enemy morale, and quickly win the war in Europe. The build-up to implement this strategy didn't happen overnight. It wasn't easy, and it wasn't quick. Unacceptable losses early on created a must-have priority for long-range tactical support. But gradually, the build-up gained momentum. Squadron after squadron of new aircraft arrived by sea and air. With newly developed tactics and sophisticated technical gear, more effective bomb loads, and fresh, highly motivated crews. American bomber losses decreased as the new fighters won air superiority in hard-fought air-to-air combat, making it possible for Allied forces to launch the long-awaited invasion of Normandy in June of 44.
With the invasion of Normandy behind them, with their fighters in control of the sky, General Arnold and his staff concentrated on their primary objective, the devastation of the Third Reich's war machine. With precision high-altitude strikes, the 8th and 15th Air Forces virtually eliminated Germany's petroleum and chemical industries, destroyed their transportation system, brought the Luftwaffe back to Earth, the Wehrmacht to a crawl, and the Third Reich to its knees. Mission accomplished. Now the Army Air Forces turned the full weight of their strike power on Japan. Fast Navy carrier task forces, submarines, and amphibious assault forces had already forced the Japanese to give up most of their early gains. General George C. Kenney's small but effective Air Force helped General MacArthur lay the groundwork for the Pacific Offensive. Countering, thrusting, hitting the enemy hard in daring, innovative raids. Now, the 21st Bomber Command had B-29s in the Marianas. They were within striking distance of Japan. When Major General Curtis LeMay took over the 21st, he noted that Japanese industries were dispersed and highly flammable. He developed a new strategy. Bombers went in low, day and night, burning the enemy's industrial centers to the ground and weakening the Japanese will to continue fighting. In one raid, LeMay's bombers reduced 15 square miles of downtown Tokyo to ashes. Later, the 21st kept hammering suitable strategic targets with precision daylight attacks at medium altitude. By the summer of 45, the Japanese economy was in a state of collapse. The people were on a starvation diet and sick of war. Still, the will to resist was there, and estimates of American casualties during an invasion of the Japanese homeland were staggering. On the 6th of August, 1945, all these considerations became academic. At 8.11 a.m., the Enola Gay arrived, on time, on target, over Hiroshima. Three days later, another nuclear bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. The war was over. A new age had begun. A Blue Ribbon Civilian Survey Team was appointed by the President. Their job, to analyze the results of our strategic bombing techniques in Europe and the Pacific. They concluded that strategic air power played a decisive role in winning the war. And further, it could play an equally forceful role in keeping the peace. The first step in that direction was taken March 21, 1946, 
when SAC was established as one of three major combat commands of the U.S. Army Air Forces. SAC was originally headquartered at Bowling Field, Washington, D.C. Six and a half months later, it moved to Andrews Field, Maryland. General Kenny, now the first SAC commander, took the controls with approximately 100,000 military personnel, 22 major installations, over 30 minor bases, and about 1,300 aircraft, including some 300 B-29 bombers, as well as P-51s and C-54s. SAC was tasked to conduct long-range offensive operations and develop a nuclear bombing force. Within four months, the atomic bomb test Operation Crossroads at Bikini Atoll demonstrated the command's nuclear capability to friend and foe alike. SAC units flew goodwill and training flights to England, West Germany, Italy, France, Holland, and Belgium, demonstrating the long-range basing capabilities of strategic air power. The National Security Act of 1947 established the Air Force as a separate service. January 13, 1948, all Army airfields became Air Force bases. A month later, SAC received its first B-50s, a bomber resembling the B-29, but designed to give better performance at higher altitudes and increased range. Shortly thereafter, the first B-36 was delivered. SAC was ready to flex its muscles, and just in time. June 1948, crisis in Germany, the Berlin blockade. SAC redeployed B-29 squadrons to England and Germany and went on 24-hour alert, a powerful deterrent force. The crisis was contained. The largest airlift in the history of aviation proceeded to a successful conclusion. That June, General Kenny held a bombing tournament to stimulate interest in bombing accuracy. Since its rather simple beginning, the bomb comp has grown through the years to include tanker and navigation competition. In July, SAC's first tanker squadrons were activated. These KB-29Ms made extended non-stop flights practical. General Curtis E. LeMay assumed command on the 19th of October, 1948, shortly before SAC moved its headquarters to Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. In-flight refueling, round-the-world flights, bombing tournaments, and spot promotions for outstanding aircrew members helped build morale, brought new vigor to the spirit of competition and achievement. June 1950, North Korea stormed into South Korea.
the Strategic Air Command initiated combat air refueling over North Korea. SAC B-29s made history in their first real test of combat readiness, destroying every strategic industrial target in North Korea in three months. In 1951, SAC upgraded its bombers to the jet age with the B-47, an intercontinental bomber when refueled by air. After the end of hostilities in Korea, our B-29 wings were returned to the States to be equipped with the new B-47s. The introduction of KC-97 tankers made air refuelings even more efficient and extended the range of the SAC forces. In August and September of 1953, a mass flight of B-36 aircraft from the 92nd Bomb Wing visited bases in Japan, Okinawa, and Guam. Nicknamed Operation Big Stick, this 30-day exercise came shortly after the termination of hostilities in Korea and demonstrated the U.S. determination to use every means possible to maintain peace in the Far East. The Soviets exploded their first hydrogen bomb in August of 1953 and gave our national defense buildup added impetus. All phases of SAC training moved ahead at full throttle. Throughout the early 50s, SAC became more involved in the development of intercontinental missiles as a means of increasing its long-range striking power. In June 1955, we received our first B-52. With the addition of this new aircraft, we began to develop a system which kept a percentage of the force on continuous combat alert, ready to respond. This is MITO, minimum interval takeoff, a tactic devised to reduce vulnerability to attack on the ground. the KC-135 tanker, and the first U-2 reconnaissance aircraft were delivered to SAC in June 1957. Three B-52s demonstrated the ability to fly non-stop around the world with aerial refueling. July 1957, General LeMay moved up to become Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and General Thomas S. Power assumed command of SAC. Also in mid-1957, reflex action was initiated. This concept of forward deployment placed selected crews and aircraft on ground alert at overseas bases. The professionalism of the crews and the support of their families made this kind of duty possible. As the Soviets improved their high altitude defense system, SAC, in coordination with the Federal Aviation Agency, established a complex of low level routes over which our bombers flew training missions. Again, demanding duty in locations far removed from the facilities of a modern base. The introduction of the B-52G model brought many refinements to the weapon system, including the Hound Dog missile, which was designed as a defense suppression weapon. General Power supervised the integration of intercontinental ballistic missiles into the force. Atlas and Titan wings were activated in 1958.
1960, America's first supersonic bomber, the B-58 Hustler, was delivered. New speed records were set. The Joint Strategic Planning Staff was created in 1960 to integrate the targeting of the Navy's ballistic missiles and carrier air and SAC's bomber and missile systems. The Commander-in-Chief of SAC serves as the director. A Navy Admiral is the deputy director. Also in 1960, a specially modified KC-135 from the 34th Air Refueling Squadron demonstrated the ability to function as an airborne command post. It would assume command and control over SAC's forces in the event that the primary and alternate command posts should be knocked out by enemy attack. Today, the airborne command post missions are nicknamed the Looking Glass and operate around the clock. On a daily basis, the command and control over SAC's forces is exercised by the National Command Authorities through the Commander-in-Chief of SAC from the underground command post located at Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. Execution of SAC's forces can only occur after an authenticated execution message is received from the National Command Authorities. Throughout most of the 60s, SAC kept a large portion of its forces on 15-minute ground alert and periodically flew some of its B-52 heavy bombers on continuous airborne alert. This was known as Chrome Dome. When the Cuban Missile Crisis came, SAC was fully prepared and bombers and missiles generated to full alert status. SAC's RB-47s, KC-97s, and KC-135s searched 825,000 square miles of ocean with over 1,500 sightings. B-47s and B-52s flew 20 million miles in two orbit areas, transferring 70 million gallons of fuel in the process. The blockade was effective. The Soviets backed down, and SAC monitored the dismantling process with U-2 reconnaissance flights. The RC-135 reconnaissance platform began replacing the RB-47 as one of the primary sources of gathering information on selected reconnaissance targets for theater commanders, the Department of Defense, and national command authorities. The Titan II force and the first two Minuteman wings became operational in 1963. SAC became a more evenly mixed force of ICBMs and manned aircraft. As our strategic missile capability grew, we followed the example of the bomb competition with a demonstration of what our missile people could do. We called it Olympic Arena, evaluation of the top crews from various wings in the areas of operations, maintenance, and security. SAC became involved in Southeast Asian operations in June of 1964 when tankers were used to support combat operations. Till the end of the war, this tanker support of all Southeast Asia air operations was known as Young Tiger. Fighter bombers striking targets in the north were sustained by multiple refuelings on one mission. Top off the tanks just after takeoff, another drink before penetrating the target area and another 900 gallon per minute contact to make it home. 
as many as five refuelings for one fighter have been recorded when battle damage was experienced. At its peak, reached in September of 1972, SAC counted some 3,900 air refueling sorties. Tanker operations over an eight-year period can be viewed as a truly outstanding page in Air Force history. During the mid-60s, the B-47 and KC-97 were retired. In early 1966, SAC took delivery of the first SR-71B trainer reconnaissance aircraft, capable of flying three times the speed of sound and operating at altitudes over 80,000 feet. When manned with a crew of two, the SR-71 could survey an area of 60,000 miles in one hour. As the 60s closed, the FB-111 variable sweep wing bomber came into the force. Some earlier Minuteman versions were replaced by MIRV Minuteman 3s, and the B-58s were retired. As combat operations in Southeast Asia continued to escalate in the mid-60s, the role of the B-52 became paramount. Modifications called Big Belly permitted the Superfortress to carry 60,000 pounds of iron bombs on one flight. This could be a mixture of 750, 500, and 250 pound bombs, depending on the target. Obviously, this was a big task just to supply the ordnance for the thousands of cities flown. Forces in the battle for Quezon relied on the B-52 to destroy the enemy's supply buildup, helping to break the siege and force the North Vietnamese to withdraw. day period in December 1972, SAC flew 729 sorties of intensive bombing against targets around Hanoi and Haiphong. This operation was known as Linebacker 2. These are three crew members who flew on the first mission and recall their feelings. Prior to the mission, uh, none of us knew what, uh, where our target would be that night. Uh, we knew something big was up beings that no one was flying that day. They were saving all the sorties uh, for later that night. And we walked into our briefing and we, we saw where our target was going to be. And everybody looked and just stared at the, at the drawing board. The field of thoughts was from why me ranging up to, uh, it's about time that we're going up and doing this. Maybe we can get our prisoners back. That particular bomb runner, we were bombing the uh, radio complex in southwestern Hanoi area. It was probably the best bomb run that we, have, as a crew, have made over there. It was, everything was perfect. Not one of us sitting downtown Hanoi had the slightest fear of a bomb dropping inside that prison compound. Not one of us. We had some very good friends after the first night who were POWs. It meant a little bit more when you knew somebody on the ground was a POW down there. Now that they are back, um, it's a thing of the past. Uh, I'm glad we did it. I'm, I'm sure it played an important part. Linebacker 2, a validation of a nation's intent.
an extraordinary new missile replaced the Hound Dog in 1972. A single B-52 could carry 20 of the new SRAMs. General Russell E. Doherty assumed command of SAC August 1st, 1974. Assuming the responsibility of the world's mightiest military force is a sobering moment for me. The American people and our Commander-in-Chief do not lightly grant, nor do I lightly accept, the command and planning responsibilities for the primary nuclear forces of the free world. But I know that I'm not alone in accepting this responsibility. The distilled maturity and wisdom of all the prior commanders of Strategic Air Command literally abound in the plans, the procedures, and the weapon systems of the Air Forces, the divisions, and the wings of this great command. The legacy of Generals Kenny and LeMay, on down through my lineage to General J.C. Meyer, my immediate predecessor, is indeed rich and substantial. I'm not alone in this responsibility because I know I will have the help of the very best and most dedicated group of military people in the world. One month after General Doherty took the controls, one of Sachs' SR-71s set a new world record from New York to London. Another record was set on the return flight, as the same aircraft with a different crew streaked from London to Los Angeles, averaging over 1,400 miles per hour. December 23, 1974. The first B-1A flew a one-and-a-half-hour test flight. This new low-level penetrator was smaller than the B-52 and carried twice the payload. During April 1975, SAC began the transfer of 128 KC-135 tankers to the Air Reserve Forces, with the proviso that SAC would gain control of these units in the event of wartime mobilization. In November of 75, jurisdiction of the 1st Airborne Command and Control Squadron was given to SAC. A new aircraft, the E-4A, was outfitted with advanced communications equipment to serve as the National Emergency Airborne Command Post. That same year, the Minuteman Force Modernization Program was completed replacing Minuteman 1 ICBMs with Minuteman 2s or 3s. Prompted by the continuing development of the air-launched cruise missile, President Carter canceled the B-1 program in 1977. 20 DC-10s were ordered for the Advanced Tanker Cargo Aircraft Program. In June 1979, President Carter approved full-scale engineering development of a new ICBM, the MX missile. The system is survivable, it's verifiable, it has a minimum impact on the environment, it's affordable in cost, and it's consistent with our SALT goal of deep reductions in strategic arms. In the years to come, the MX would become the subject of heated debate over the proposed basing mode and its relationship to the strategic arms limitation talks. During 79, SAC exercised every phase of its role in the single integrated operational plan, short of nuclear warfare. Global Shield 79 was a command-wide total effort. It was the first test of SAC and Associated Air Reserve Forces units to carry out their assigned wartime mission together. Global Shield 81 was the largest exercise in SAC history. A no-notice, command-wide exercise, it involved over 100,000 personnel in the United States and Guam, plus a full range of aircraft and missiles.
1981, the first two air-launched cruise missiles were delivered to Griffiths Air Force Base, New York. In March of that year, the KC-10 arrived, the first new air refueler since 1957. On October 2nd, 1981, President Reagan reinstated the B-1 bomber and endorsed continued development of the MX missile. The KC-135R, completely re-engined, arrived in June of 82. Designed to carry more gas, its efficiency in offloading translates into a command-wide fuel savings of 3 million barrels per year. This modification will extend the life of the KC-135 fleet beyond the year 2000. June 17, 1983. The MX, now called the Peacekeeper, was up and away on its first flight. August 1983, the joint U.S.-Egyptian exercise Bright Star 83. SAC members were drawn from across the command to provide the combat support element. to its normal peacetime role, during the military operation in Grenada, SAC aircraft flew reconnaissance missions and provided in-flight refueling for tactical aircraft flying directly from distant bases. In April of 1986, the KC-10 demonstrated its dramatic improvement in air refueling capability. The KC-10 refueled and escorted the F-111s from the United Kingdom, which struck terrorist installations in Libya. The Peacekeeper missile began to join the force in SAC's 40th anniversary year. It becomes part of the triad of deterrence, the ICBM, the sub-launched ballistic missiles, and the manned bombers. The delivery of the first B-1B in early 1985 promised significant improvement in our ability to penetrate the enemy's air defenses. By October of 1986, its initial operational capability was obtained at Dias Air Force Base. The first B-1B stood combat alert. Even though smaller than the B-52, it's more than half again as fast and can carry a larger payload of either conventional or nuclear weaponry. The commander-in-chief of SAC, General John Chain, visited his new B-1B unit at Dias and commented, This is an exciting and dynamic time to be in the Strategic Air Command. We have more on our plate, more going on, than any other command. And we're upgrading existing weapon systems, such as the B-52, the KC-135, and the Minuteman missile. At the same time, we're bringing on new systems with greater combat capability. Continuing SAC's proud heritage requires that we take care of our people and maintain our high standards. Our pride in our profession and our commitment to excellence. For more than 40 years, the men and women of the Strategic Air Command have proudly stood to defend our nation's freedom and preserve our way of life. I am proud to share with you this rich heritage and our bright future together.